The title of this message is The Doctrine of Balaam Nesting in the Church. Now, I take this title from a parable uh, Jesus gave in the Gospels about the mustard tree and the birds. He's talking about the church growing up to be like a mustard tree and birds coming in and landing in the branches of the tree. And what we know about this is that the mustard tree represents the church and the birds are not part of the church, though. They find a way to take up residence in the church. Uh, this is a video is a part of a two-part series. The other video is about the spirit of Jezebel nesting in the church. A link is provided in the description below. Now in this video, we will focus on the church in Pergamos, Pergamum and the doctrine of Balaam that has taken up residence in that church. And we will look at how the same doctrine has found a nesting place in the branches of the church today. At the end of this video, I will give my testimony how I was introduced to the way of Balaam and was passionate about the teachings of Balaam right up until the time God intervened and pulled the curtain back and showed me the reality of this doctrine. Now, out of the seven churches Jesus talks about in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, there are only two he does not have an issue with. They are the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia. All seven of these churches are located in the western part of what is now modern-day Turkey. It's called Asia back then. But out of the five remaining churches, three of them have issues of the heart. The first is church of Ephesus. Though sound in doctrine, they have lost their first love. The church in Sardis uh, is putting on the appearance of being religious, except they are in fact dead. And the church of the Laodiceans have become so worldly, they are no heavenly good. Now the remaining two churches, Pergamos and the church in Thyatira, they are those that are under the influence of false doctrine and evil people, under the influence of Satan. The evil people that are teaching these false doctrines are under the influence of Satan. Not only are some of them under the influence of these false teachers, but the false teachers are permitted to spread their stuff without anybody trying to stop them. This is a leadership issue in those churches, and it's very serious. So let's look at this letter to the uh, uh, church in Pergamos. Revelations 2, uh, verses 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even as even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on that stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now the very first thing we notice about the church in Pergamum is that Jesus has some good things to say. So let's look at that. This is uh, first part, uh, Revelation verse 13. It says, I know your works where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days which Antiochus was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Now let's take a uh, let's take a look at the historical back background of Pergamum, and look at this map. You can see where it's located. That's in modern day Turkey. Pergamos in the northernmost is the northernmost of the seven cities, northernmost church of the seven cities where John wrote and sends the entire book of Revelations to. Pergamos is the northernmost of the seven cities 
where John wrote and sent the entire book of Revelation to. Understanding what is going on in this city during the time of the writing will shed some light on why Jesus says this city is this city in the eastern part of the Roman Empire is where Satan's throne is and where Satan dwells. Pergamum is known for being a city that was the center of imperial worship in Asia. The city had a temple dedicated to Caesar Augustus, also known as Octavian, who was the first Roman emperor and was the Roman emperor at the time of the birth of Christ. Emperor worship had become an integral part of the Roman culture by the time of Christ. It is interesting that Christ, the true king and creator of the world, was born during the time of the first Caesar of the world. The timing cannot be coincidence. Along with emperor worship, the city also worshipped at least four other false gods. That would be Zeus, Dionysus, Athene, and Askepilos. Not sure if I'm pronouncing this last one right, but Askepilos. Antiochus, the faithful martyr, is the only other martyr mentioned by name in the New Testament. The other is Stephen, who was martyred in Jerusalem in the book of Acts. Pergamum has the notoriety of being where the martyrdom of Gentiles begins. And Jew Jerusalem was, of course, where our Lord was crucified and where Stephen, who was a Jew, was martyred. Antiochus was probably martyred for refusing to worship the emperor by burning incense to him and declaring Caesar is Lord, which was the way emperor worship was conducted. Pergamum, uh, being the seat of emperor worship for the eastern part of Rome is why I believe uh, is the reason why Jesus called it the throne of Satan and where Satan dwells. The very, very place where Satan rules the kingdom of darkness from in that part of the world. Now with that in mind we can have a better understanding why Jesus is commending the saints here. The saints in Pergamos are enduring suffering and they are faithful to the Lord even in the face of death. These saints were the real deal. They are persevering under powerful dark forces and wicked men who want them dead. So what could possibly be wrong? Why does Jesus have an issue with them? How serious is this issue? We will get into all of this. But first, let's see what Jesus has uh, good to say about the church in Pergamum. The way Jesus has commended the saints of Pergamum is almost a perfect picture of the teachings of Christ. Paul, Peter, James, and John. He says, You hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. So what's the problem? As it turns out, Jesus in his loving kindness did not start off blasting the church. He knows them. He acknowledges their faithfulness to following him. Their lives are proof of this. He loves them. That is why he didn't go in blasting them right off the bat. What Jesus did here was lay a foundation for them to take seriously what he had to say next. He is going to spell it out and then issue stern warnings and demand that they repent or they're going to suffer the consequences. So we see this in Revelation 2, 14 and 15. You have there who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, though we do not have any details of what the teachings and practices of the Nicolaitans were, uh, they are being, com being compared to the practices of Balaam, of the teachings of Balaam. So there must be some similarities. I'll leave it at that. As for Balaam, though, for us to understand the doctrines and teachings of Balaam, we need to understand what Jesus is referring to, and it is not an individual named Balaam in the church. Jesus is turning the attention of the church to the story of Balaam in the Old Testament. Balaam is the name that he has assigned to the Spirit operating behind the scenes on those who are promoting these false teachings and appearing as apostles and prophets of God. What Balaam taught the Moabites and Balaam's motive for teaching them what he did is what Jesus is saying is being taught and done here in the church in Pergamum. So to get an understanding of what this doctrine of Balaam is, we need to go to the story of Balaam in the Old Testament. 
Then we will look at what the New Testament says about them. You can find the story of Balaam in Numbers chapters 22 through 24. And then you will find the fallout from what Balaam did in uh, Numbers chapter 25. So the setting for what's going on in these chapters, I'm not going to put it up, there, up on screen, but you can go read the story for yourself. The setting of what's going on is that the children of Israel are being led by Moses through the wilderness. They are approaching the borders of the Moabites. Balak, the king of Moab, observes that they are a very numerous people. He has also heard the report about how God, the God of the Israelites, delivered them from the Pharaoh and Egypt. He, that would be Balak, and Moab are very afraid of what's going on. Balak decides he's going to hire a person, Balaam, who is Balaam, who is perceived to be, have some sort of magic power and can put curses on the people. So he decides to hire Balaam to curse Israel. Things do not go as planned. Balaam was a heathen diviner, which is someone who works in the black arts of divination. And Balak sends people to go hire him for dirty deeds. So look at this, this uh, what Balak does in Numbers 22.5. It says, Then he, that would be Balak, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, to hire him. And Balak hires him, and Balaam makes it clear what Balak wanted. And we see this in Numbers 23.7. And he, that would be Balaam, took up his oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce, that would be bitterly curse Israel. Balak saw the Israelites coming, and he heard of their deliverance from Egypt. Balak was very afraid. So he sought out Balaam to curse the Israelites. What Balak did not expect, was for God to show up. God ended up letting Balaam see into the future of Israel, and then Balaam proceeded to prophesy the oracles of God and blessed Israel and did not curse him like Balak wanted him to. We see this, what uh, Balaam has to say to Balak in Numbers 23, 8. He says, How can I curse what God has not cursed? How can I denounce what God has not denounced? And this made Balak mad, and he sent Balaam away. So what can be wrong with this story? Sounds like Balaam did the right thing, and he did. Balaam heard from God and obeyed God. Balaam's portrayed in a pretty good light here. But there is more to the story. The next thing that we learn, what happens is the Israelites, after this meeting uh, that Balaam had with Balak, the Israelites' men began committing sexual immorality with the heathen women from Moab at a place called Peor, and they begin to worship and sacrifice to the Moabite idols of Baal. God ended up judging Israel pretty harshly for this apostasy by sending a plague among them that killed 24,000 people. Though Balaam is not mentioned in this particular part of uh, Israel's story in their rebellion and fornication uh, and the false god worship with the Moabites, we learn a few chapters later in Numbers 31.6 that it was Balaam that gave Balak the counsel to have the Moabite women seduce the Israelite men and cause them to fornicate and worship idols. Let's look at this in Numbers 31, 16. This is Moses talking about the event. Look at these Moabite women. He says, look at these, these Moabite women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord at the incident of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So here we learn that it was Balaam that counseled Balak and the Moabites to do this with the children of Israel. And, and later in the story, we find out that Israel and the Moabites, or excuse me, later we learn in the story that uh, Israel went to war with a group of people called Midianites, and Balaam was there, and he ends up getting killed. So he, gave his, he lost his life for what he did. But we see here what occurred between the men of Israel and the Moabite women. Sometime after Balak had sent Balaam home uh, originally because he was angry, that Balaam and Balak got together again, and apparently Balak sought Balaam's counsel to stop Israel. It probably went something like this. Balak may have said to Balaam, Balaam, if you cannot curse them as I wish, what else can be done to ensure they don't defeat us and wipe us off the map? 
Now that's modern day language, but that's probably the gist of what they talked about. Now Balaam's counsel was for Balak to have their women go and sexually seduce them in Israel and then get them to engage in idol worship. Balaam was assuming that the God of Israel would grow angry and that the Israelites would hang themselves over this provocation that their God would forsake them, maybe even destroy them. The counsel of Balaam almost worked, but beginning with the promise God made to Abraham, God took Israel to be his own. So they were punished, but not forsaken, nor destroyed. What else can we learn about Balaam? Well, the Old Testament story ends with Balaam and his death in the war that I just mentioned. But that's not the end of the story of Balaam in the Bible. The New Testament has a couple things to say about him. Balaam in 2 Peter. Peter likens people whom he calls false prophets and false teachers to be people who have forsaken the way because of a love for the wages of unrighteousness. He especially says they are fallen in the way that would be the doctrine of Balaam. We get the clearest picture of that doctrine of Balaam here in 2 Peter. Right, let's look at this. It's in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-3, through 3, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 13, uh, 15. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Now to verse 15. For they have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Peor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So Peter identifies who is being deceived as well here. They are God's people. We see this in the two phrases, among you in uh, verse 1 and exploit you in verse 3. Peter goes on to explain the serious judgment of such people and their followers and ends up by saying all of this teaching of covetousness, remember this is how it started, is idol uh, all this teaching of covetousness, which Paul calls idolatry, is the way of Balaam. And Peter compares not only the teachers of these covetous things, but he accuses the whole bunch listening to these teachings, uh, teachings to people walking in the way of Balaam. This is the clearest reason for Jesus' issue with the church in Pergamum. So let's dissect the doctrine of Balaam then. We see the primary foundation of the way or the doctrine of Balaam is one of destructive heresies. That's in verse, uh, verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 2. That find their way into, to the church because of covetousness. That's found in verse 3. Uh, covetousness in the hearts of the people. Covetousness is simply the desire for more. Covetousness is a part of the original sin. When Eve saw that the tree was desirable is when sin entered. She ate the fruit and Adam ate the fruit. The desire itself, in and of itself, was covetousness. Covetousness is many things. For example, is the desire for more money, more stuff, whatever our minds and, and our eyes seek after that is opposed to the way of Christ. Whatever that thing is that is forbidden, like when Eve saw and desired the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was forbidden. In the Western church, there is a doctrine that teaches the pursuit of the American dream is a godly thing. This doctrine goes by many titles, but the most prevalent to hide the truth of what it really is, they call it the word of faith. And it has the focus of what God can do for me and how God will provide me all of my covetousness, worldly desires, among other things. The doctrine of Balaam is a doctrine of demons based on covetousness. We also see the way of truth is blasphemed because of this doctrine. And boy, was 2021 ever a year of the truth being blasphemed. It's all over YouTube, that's for sure. Jude has more to say about this way of Balaam. Let's look at it. In Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter in Jude, uh, verses 10 and 11. And he's speaking of these people. 
Same ones that Peter was talking about. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like Bruce, brute beast, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them! For they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Cain and Korah are also mentioned here, but I want to focus on the Balaam part to keep, to keep on point. Notice what Jude says about these teachers. They speak evil of whatever they do not know. And then he says, what they think they have figured out, they've gotten it completely wrong because they corrupt themselves in speaking and teaching about what they think they know because they twist God's word to make it a word of covetousness. As it says, greedily in the era of Balaam, for profit is the way they run. It's the way they took God's word. And we're going to get into this a little bit more, a little more clear in a moment. Now, lest we think Jude is speaking of outsiders, let me show you. He is, uh, he is speaking of the same wicked birds delivering the message in the church. So he's talking about these, these, these messengers, these, these wicked people are delivering their, their message to God's people. In Jude, verse 12. These, these are spots, these wicked people, in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only in themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. The way of Balaam, which I call today the Word of Faith movement, uh, also known as the Prosperity Gospel, is one that says God doesn't want you poor. It teaches that God's will, it teaches that God will give you wealth, the wealth of the sinners and other things along those lines. In a nutshell, it teaches God will give his people the American dream. It is a greedy, for-profit teaching. It is all about the money. It is a worldly doctrine to, a cor to the core. It is a demonic doctrine to the core. So well, let's look at, at, at some other verses on this. We see that the issue that Jesus had with the church of Pergamum was they, they adhered to the teachings of Balaam and they also practiced idolatry. And Paul says that covetousness is an idolatry in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore, he says, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. The teachers of this doctrine of Balaam are masters of twisting the word of God uh, that they think they know, but they don't actually know. They make covetousness seem like the godliest thing in the world. They literally teach that godliness is a means of getting money and stuff out from God. Look at what Paul has to say, say about this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. He says of these people, Useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds. Remember the, what Jews said? They think they know, but their minds are corrupt. Uh, they're corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. So we're going back to church Pergamos here. Revelations uh, chapter 2, verse 14. This is what Jesus says. I have a few things against you. Because you have there who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So we can sum up the doctrine of Balaam like this. It is a doctrine of covetousness, a doctrine of worldliness, a doctrine that allows the practice of immorality, a doctrine of idolatry. We can see in this passage it includes, you know, eating stuff sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. Let's look at these. So how is covetousness to be identified? We already took a quick look at what Paul had to say about it. We're going to look at it again. Covetousness can be identified, or you, I suppose you can identify it in yourself by a lack of contentment with what you have. Uh, a person who is covetousness always want more. Credit card debt, for the most part, is debt built on covetousness. For the Christians that have out-of-control debt, outside of emergencies and health reasons and stuff like that, it is because of covetousness. 
to desire to have more. So let's look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 5 through 8 again in the light of that. Again, the teachings of these men is useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Now contrast that to this, what, what he goes on to say, and starting with verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and, we cert and it is certain we will carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. There is going to be no U-Haul following you to wherever your destination is when you die. So we saw in the text directed to a church in Pergamos that they that there were other things going on other than following in the doctrines of Balaam. That would be sacrificing to idols and eating food offered to idols, sexual immorality and the like. A person caught up in the doctrine of Balaam today probably isn't sacrificing to actual idols like they did back then. They may or may not be committing the physical act of sexual immorality that is pointed out in the text, though sexual immorality is rampant in the church, especially sex out of wedlock. However, there is also spiritual immorality that is compared to idolatry and sexual immorality. And the New Testament makes this clear, that God considers covetousness to be idolatry, and worldliness, which is what covetousness produces, is compared to adultery. That would be sexual immorality. Let's look at it. We've already looked at what Paul says. Therefore, put to death covetousness, which is idolatry. Let's look at what James says. James chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. He says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Because of covetousness is what he's saying here. And then this is what he goes on to say, he ties this to something spiritual. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. There is no getting around this. An enemy of God. Here, James makes that connection that idolatry, worldliness is adultery towards God. This is all from God's perspective. So what does Jesus require now that we see this from God's perspective? In one word, if this is going on, he requires repentance. Let's look at this in Revelation. So still talking to the church in Pergamos, Revelation 2, 16 and 17. Therefore repent, but if not, if you won't do it, I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has ear, an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on that stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. This is a solemn warning from Jesus about this matter of following in the way of Balaam. Jesus will accept nothing short of repentance. Without repentance... Those holding on to this doctrine will find Jesus fighting against them, making war against them. Jesus will not consider them to be in the group of the overcomers. They won't get the white stone. They won't get the hidden manna. They won't get eternal life, is what Jesus is saying here. As Jesus pointed out, some will be able to hear this message that he's speaking to the church by extension. Others will not. They will go on to destruction. So what does repentance look like? First, it means doing a 180-degree turn away from this doctrine. That's what repentance means. It is a changing of the mind. In other words, I was going headlong into this doctrine of covetousness, and now I know the truth of the matter. I have to make a decision. Will I forsake covetousness? Will I put covetousness to death? Will I quit following these false teachers and these false prophets and these false apostles? Will I rid my house of every evil work of theirs that I have? These are questions that need, to, need the yes word to be the answer. This is the first step in turning away from the doctrine of Balaam. 
The second step is to turn to God. So getting the perspective from the counsel of God, uh, from the entirety of the New Testament, when it speaks about covetousness, mammon, riches, and the like, uh, we need to renew our minds with the truth about what God has to say about all this. And here are a few verses for the person who's caught up in this stuff, but, it, but the light's gone on and says, hey, wait a minute, that's me. Here's a few verses to think on. Let's start with what Jesus has to say in Luke chapter 8, verse 14. And as for what fell among the thorns, he's describing the four different types of soil that the seed's being sown on here, and he's actually giving the interpretation. So this is soil number three, the thorny soil. So as for what fell on the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares of riches and the pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. And by the way, these thorns, the thorny soil, is what Jesus says how we can identify false prophets and teachers. Somewhere in their teaching, they teach that the desiring of these thorns, that would be what, what Jesus called it, called these thorns, riches and pleasures of this life, right? So somewhere in their teaching, they're, they are saying the desires of these thorns, these riches and pleasures of life, is a good thing. They teach that greed is good, though they would never use the word greed, for that is a dead giveaway. So let me emphasize this even a little bit more. Matthew 7, 16. This is what Jesus says to false prophets. He says, you will recognize them by their fruits. So he says, okay, there's some fruit you can look for here to recognize these guys. And he says, are grapes gathered from what? Thorn bushes, grapes being good fruit, or figs gathered from thistles? Figs being good fruit. What did Jesus just say the fruit of these false prophets were? Thorn bushes and thistles. What did Jesus say that the third soil was? Cares of this life, riches and pleasures of life. He calls it thorns. So you can identify, you can recognize false apostles, false teachers, and the like. In their messages, they are going to have that God wants you to be rich. God wants you to have the American dream. God wants you to prosper in this world. He wants to give you the world and the things of this world. That's the fruit Jesus says look for. And you can identify these guys as being false. So, so that, that is the fruit of the word of faith and the prosperity gospel. Thorns and thistles are polished up and twisted using the Bible to say that God wants us to have all the covetous desires of our heart. And that's just the bottom line right there. There's no getting around that. So let's look at something Paul has to say. We already looked at it, but we're going to look at it again. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. For those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed away from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows what did they pierce catch that word pierce themselves with they pierced themselves with thorns the desire for riches and other things is what jesus talked about the thorns on that thorny soil thorns and thistles of the false prophets that's what they pierce themselves with and they get drowned into destruction and perdition because of it one more passage here Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Keep your lives free from the love of money, which is covetousness, and be content with what you have. Why? Here's the reason why he's saying keep yourselves free from the love of money and be content. Because God says, I will never leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid what man can do to me. Notice we are not to let the love of money and stuff be the motivations of our lives, but rather be content with what God has provided. Rather than seeking more stuff, God wants us to resign ourselves to the counsel of His will for our lives because of this promise that He made to us. I will never leave you or forsake you. He said that right in the context of don't love money. And because God has said this, we can with confidence trust in His will for our lives. Because he says, the Lord is my helper. 
I will not be afraid what man can do to me. All right, third step. Turn to the Lord. Look at what God desires for us and the pure repercussions that will take place. Psalms 37.4 Delight yourselves also in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Notice that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, He will give us the desires of a heart. Does this mean He will give someone a better paying job? A new car? Fix relationships? Maybe. It's not the stuff that's evil. It's the love for it that's evil. But anyhow, ultimately when we begin to delight ourselves in the Lord, our desires change. What used to be a longing for money and stuff or other things has changed into a longing for God Himself. The desires of our heart becomes the desires of His heart. And you can know that He will give you the desires of your heart when your heart is lined up with Him like that. There is a place that the Lord wants to bring each one of us. That is to a place where we completely trust Him and accept His will for our lives. One thing is for sure, covetousness, the desire of things, and the love of money, and the things of this world, is not His will for our lives. True peace and joy will only be found when we are immersed in Him. Jesus points this out in His Word. Matthew 6.25 Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. What you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Jesus wants to bring us to this place where we're no longer worrying about, thinking about, and desiring, and pursuing after these things. He wants to bring us to the place where we get our pleasure from drinking from His well of living water and eating from His words of life. That is where He wants to bring each and every one of us, and that's where He will bring us. If that's where you want Him to bring you, He will bring you there. In Him is the place where the desires of our heart get changed from covetousness to an intense desire for Him. He wants to bring us there, and He can bring us there. Something I have learned from and about the Lord is this. Many times when I look into His Word, it reflects back on, back on me some part of my life that is wrong. It's not where it should be. I'm missing the mark somehow. What I have learned in seeing these things, it is not condemnation from the Lord, but rather a destination He wants to bring me to. The destination is to be conformed to the image of His Son, and that my life will imitate Christ's life because Christ's life is in me. What this does is invoke a desire to obey His Word and to go to prayer about whatever the matter may be that I'm coming up short about and to humble myself and ask for His mercy and His grace to help me get to that destination. He knows we cannot do it or get there alone. The plan has never been that when we get saved, the rest of the Christian walk is now on our shoulders and up to us to make it happen. Not at all. For we can do nothing unless we abide in Him. So, covetousness, it's a, it's a hard taskmaster. Uh, covetousness is a hard taskmaster. It is impossible to get free of it on our own. There are rea realities living in the world. We have to earn a living. We have to eat. The baby needs a new pair of shoes. Our Heavenly Father is aware that we need this stuff. Like I said, stuff in and of itself is not evil. It is a matter of the heart. God wants all of our heart and will settle for nothing less. Thankfully, He invites us to come to Him about anything, including problems with covetousness. We see this in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. That would be Jesus. But we have one who was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may be able to receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now, as I said at the beginning of this, that at the end I was going to give my testimony about my involvement in the Word of Faith or the Prosperity Teachings. When I became born again by the blood of Christ at the age of 16, almost 17, it was not long. Matter of fact, I was almost immediately introduced to the prosperity doctrines of 
uh, through Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland. It seems to be the natural course in America or in American churches. You get born again, and it's the first thing you're going to be introduced to is God wants you to have everything the desires of your heart. Well, I was introduced to Kenneth Copeland. Uh, excuse me. I was introduced to Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland. Now, these teachings brought out the worst covetousness that was in me. I didn't know it, but that's what was happening. Literally, I was claiming a Corvette for myself, among other things. After all, these teachings say that God would give us the desires of our heart. Then one night I had a dream. Kenneth Copeland was preaching, and right before my eyes, while he was at the pulpit preaching, he transformed into a demon. That was in my dream. Now, at the time of this dream, I didn't even know about the verse in 1 Timothy that talks about the doctrines of demons. Let's look at it, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, or doctrines of demons would be what King James says. Nor did I know about what Paul had to say about fake apostles appearing to be apostles of Christ. That's in 2 Corinthians 11, chapters 13 through 15. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Now, I didn't know about these verses, and God will grant me understanding of them later in life. What did happen at the moment of the dream is I could no longer listen to anything Hagen or Copeland had to say. Now, I am hesitant to share dreams that God has given me because of all the abuse of so-called dreams and visions that these liars are all the time talking about and promoting to produce evil in the church and to make themselves look good and to glorify themselves. But I felt that this was, irrelevant. This was relevant to share this one because it's backed up with sound doctrine and it directly relates to the message that I just gave. Now, these verses I just listed are a start. There's so much more to say on the subject, and I could go on for hours, literally. Uh, but you can search out the matter in Scripture. There's plenty of places. One last warning I want to give you, and this comes from the book of Proverbs. Please take this seriously. This is Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Father, I come to you. Lord, you know how we are pressed in on every side by the powers of darkness that we can't even see. We don't even know what's going on. Lord, in every influence, in every way in this world says you deserve more. You're much, many evil teachers in your church are saying you deserve more. That you, that you are like some kind of an ATM God to give the desires of our covetous hearts. Father, purge us. Purge us from covetousness. Father, put covetousness under your feet, Lord, and destroy it once and for all in our lives. Help us to see and recognize these false teachers by their teaching of worldliness. Taking your teachings, Lord Jesus, and put mixing it with their poison and, and destroying, bringing into destruction and perdition those who drink from their poisonous cup of wine, from that golden cup that the whore sitting on the beast in the book of revelations is causing people to drink and destroying them lord through prosperity through covetousness through worldliness father help us to see and lord turn us give us the grace and mercy to turn our hearts towards you to turn our desires toward you for lord if you will turn us we will be turned Lord, grant us that grace to want to desire you. Lord, work in us to desire. Give us the grace to desire, to will, and to do your good pleasure. Help each one of us see and be more than overcomers in this. Help us to put this stuff to death in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.